Lakita Stein. Lakita, can you let people in and then we should be ready to go. Oh, hold on one second. Welcome everyone, welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad that you are here. We're gonna get started momentarily. Just gonna give folks another minute or two to jump in. I uh, definitely wanna say on the front end, uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, if you wanna grab a notepad, grab a piece of paper, grab whatever you feel like you need to get things started, then we will do that accordingly. Um, and so again, welcome uh, for those of you who are meeting me for the first time. Uh, my name is Tafari Melisizwe. I am the communications coordinator for the Dignity in Schools campaign. And I will be playing the role of back in host. <laughs> um, so you will not hear my voice very long, uh, but we will uh, talk and chop it up about, um, I think this incredibly poignant subject matter. Um, I also make you aware that we are streaming live on Facebook as well. So if you want to navigate to uh, the Dignity in Schools uh, Facebook page and um, jump in there and uh, share with your friends and family who may not have registered to join but are so interested in joining, uh, that is definitely where they can participate in the discussion as well. And so again, welcome, glad that you're here. Uh, you are in incredibly capable hands, um, and we're going to get started in about um, another minute or so. So sit back, relax, and um, we'll get started in a bit. Just another moment or two, and then we'll get started. Did you send an agenda? So we're gonna talk about the proceedings um, just momentarily. Uh, this is, um, as this is a public facing event, uh, the discussion is really a presentation that we're gonna set up the frame for in a moment. So, um, but oh, the agenda okay. is, is broadly, um, talking a little bit about, um, you know, the moment that we find ourselves in with the um, whoever is going to be the incoming uh, Secretary of Education. And um, I think what our work is going to, you know, center on and in some ways try to celebrate as part one of this three part series is as the question kind of leads in and actually we can go ahead and, you know, make this the beginning of the frame. So. Uh, again, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Tafari Malasizwe, Communications Coordinator for the Dignity in Schools campaign. So glad that you're here. We are simulcasting on Facebook Live as well. Um, and you are uh, welcome to part one of Secretary of Education for Whom, uh, which is a three-part series that's been developed by the Dignity in Schools campaign in concert with some of our members and some of our colleagues and comrades and other organizations uh, revolving around this uh, structural question um, of, you know, of whom, as we are looking at the Biden transition team, um, the appointments, the recommendations for who's going to occupy the seats of institutional power at the federal level, uh, the question that we're asking ourselves, I mean, I think many people are asking themselves is, um, for whom, for what? Uh, these these positions, these um, jobs, the this work that is before us, um, we can say that we want you know, faces that look like us in high places and understandably so. Um, and uh, what ultimately is the position? What ultimately is the frame, uh, not just the person occupying the seat? And 
Um, so as we've said, um, if, for those of you that have seen the description, um, that it is really easy to focus on individual actors. Um, you know, as we all kind of took part in joy in the uh, very fun hashtag by Betsy, um, the, the questions still remain um, after she's gone, um, not just who will replace her, um, but it's not as if the issues that were, you know, relevant at the federal level uh, were only new uh, when Betsy DeVos came into the fold. Um, it's easy to focus on individual actors. Um, oftentimes that can be used as a tool to obscure the, most, the more subtle structure that is present regardless of who occupies a seat. So what this series is aiming to do um, at the federal, state, and local level is really explore um, you know, the structures, um, not just the personalities that shape our, uh, the present state of public education. And so for those that are also new to the campaign, um, again, this event is put on by Dignity, the Dignity in Schools campaign. And who we are in short um, is about 112 organizations across 27 states that work to challenge the systemic problem of pushout in our nation's schools. As a national coalition, DSC builds power with parents, youth, organizers, advocates, educators, y'all, to transform our own communities, uh, to support alternatives to a culture of zero tolerance, punishment, criminalization, and dismantling of the public schools, and ultimately a fight against structural racism, all forms of oppression, and anything that gets in the way of our nation's young people having full spectrum access to the tools, talents, relationships, and people that they need uh, to thrive and build a world that ultimately is more in alignment with what we want. And so very shortly, um, these are kind of the session goals that are gonna guide our framing. We want you to think about these as we are uh, talking through the night. You're gonna be in very capable hands with uh, a great guest that I'm gonna introduce momentarily. But these are the five things that are really kind of guiding even what put this first event together. Um, one, understanding the overall education agenda of past and incoming presidential administrations. Because again, of course, we always, power is often inherited. Um, especially at the, the, the institutional level in the United States, passed and transferred um, at that level. And so what, what is the context um, that uh, the Biden administration is walking into? Two, identify concrete areas for folks to push the incoming Secretary of Education on. Three, identify education issue areas where we anticipate the Biden administration being weak on. Four, get ready and prime for the advocacy to work to come at each level, uh, federal, state, local, so on and so forth. And understanding key terms um, and language to look out for and create counter narratives and counter strategies towards them. Um, because if there's one thing that we know um, is that uh, federal government um, and the status quo is really good at platitudes and overtures and beautiful language um, that often doesn't render material benefits for people on the ground. And I think that uh, this moment is as good as any um, to kind of upset that setup um, and really start the conversation on the front foot. So we have uh, three incredible folks kicking it with us this evening um, who are gonna be guiding the conversation. Um, I'll introduce them in the order that they are gonna be presenting. And first uh, we have Marlene Tillman, uh, who is a DSC member, longtime DSC member, and is a parent community activist and co-founder of Gwinnett Stop. Marlene provides expertise on data research, information technology, and organization management. Uh, she currently serves as the Federal Strategies Co-Chair for the Dignity in Schools campaign. And Marlene is just an amazing, amazing colleague and comrade in the work. And then second, uh, we have Hamida Labi, who is uh, with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And Hamida has been gracious enough to uh, spend lots of time with us over the months. Um, developing and really supporting our federal education work. Um, she serves as, pol as policy counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And then last and certainly not least, uh, Guy Johnson, who is the Senior Program Director, uh, Federal and National Networks for the uh, Kindergarten or the, the K-12 program at the Opportunity Institute. One name that you saw on the agenda, Daquan Harrison, uh, who is the founder of DWH Inspires and a member of the DSC Cam uh, Dignity in Schools campaign as well. Unfortunately, he's unable to join us this evening, uh, but we will still definitely have his work and his ideas in the fold. And so without further ado, uh, we can go ahead and get started. I can get out the way uh, and toss you to the very capable hands of Marlene Tillman. Uh, so Marlene, uh, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This should be really, really fun. 
Um, mm. And we hope that you get a lot of good information as well as give a lot of good information. So um, we're gonna go ahead and begin. Next slide. So the U.S. Department of Education was founded in 1979 by then President Jimmy Carter. And Ed's mission is to promote student achievement, preparation for global competitiveness um, by fostering educational excellence and ensuring equal access. So their duties include establishing policies around federal education funding and the distribution and monitoring of those funds. Um, research and data collection, which we all love, um, to address the issues that impact student achievement, as well as the enforcement of civil rights laws. Next, please. And so the Elementary Secondary Education Act was a civil rights bill that was signed in, I believe, 1965 as part of LBJ's War on Poverty. We knew that states weren't educating poor and Black children. I mean, that was just a fact. And the passage of the Title um, VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 opened the door for Johnson to start focusing the federal education work on civil rights. Laws that were subsequently passed, such as um, Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which prohibited discrimination based on race, sex, disability, um, made civil rights enforcement a fundamental part of federal education work. So the logic is if you accept a penny of the federal money, then you have to comply with federal civil rights laws. Schools needed the money, so the deal was struck to give the feds a lot of say in local education. Next, please. So we started with ESEA, the Elementary Secondary Education Act. Um, and then we progressed. Next, please. And from there, we got No Child Left Behind in CLB. And Bush got this bright idea in 2002. Does anyone want to share one thing they remember about um, <laughs> NCLB, No Child Left Behind? You can just drop it in the chat. you education warriors out there. <laughs> yeah, I knew that was going to be the first one. Testing, subgroups, high stakes testing. Um, yeah, yeah. It was a major component of it, wasn't it? <laughs> so No Child Left Behind claimed, um, the next slide please, claimed to hold schools accountable for student outcomes. It was a collaborative effort um, of folks on the Hill, civil rights groups who weren't talking to the ground, conservatives and business leaders to advance American competitiveness, you know where that came from, and close the achievement gap between poor and students of color and their more disadvantaged peers. So um, through its testing component, which you all identified first, um, through its testing requirement, states were required to bring all students to the proficient level on state tests by 2013-14 school year. How did that work out? Although each state still got to decide individually what proficiency should look like. Um, and they got to decide which tests to use. But parents and advocates came to understand that No Child Left Behind was way more effective at ramping up the school to prison pipeline than anything else. And it left everybody behind except those who typically achieve. So we know about test punish and push out. Um, another slogan that emerged from um, that, that law was fire, fire, close. Fire the principal, fire the staff, and if all else fail after we've discriminated against you with resources and, and, um, <laughs> and all the things you would need to be successful, then we'll close down your school and privatize it or send you all the way across town. You'll end up with no local schools and definitely um, not traditional public schools, which have less accountability. Next. And so now we're up to the ESSA timeline. Um, 
And we're up to the next new marketing name, um, the Every Student Succeeds Act. It became law in December of 2015. Next. And so ESSA was another one of those bipartisan deals um, for local control. ESSA had a lot of good uh, uh, components, but it lacked accountability. Um, was the whole thing that ESA, that ESEA was about. So it's a civil rights law, but you took away the accountability metrics in order to force the states to do what you already knew they don't want to do. And that's be mindful of children's civil rights, be mindful of students with disabilities, um, ensure that children really are being set up to learn. And so, um, with that, we had all the things that, the good things that happened in ESSA. Um, it had um, lots of parent engagement. We got metrics around school climate. We got um, everyone supposed to have um, a highly engaging curriculum. Um, students with disabilities were supposed to be considered and looked at and supported in the ways they needed. Um, but states got to decide um, what to publicly disclose in their state plans, what goals they set for students, how to distribute the money and resources, all the things that the feds were initially setting up in ESEA to make more accountable, to make sure that students who had less got more. They got what they needed to have. And so, um, they agreed to the, like I said, the parent and community engagement. Um, They're supposed to have more transparency. Um, notice I said the qualifying word of suppose. Um, and they're, they're supposed to look at those underserved um, student groups. That's happened kind of on an up and down level. Next, please. So that brings us to the current administration. Hi, bye, Betsy. Um, and so, <laughs> Betsy DeVos. So how many of you remember Betsy's um, affirmation hearing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you remember most about that confirmation hearing? What stood out? I remember being in at the New York, um, at the DSC office at the time the hearing was taking place and we were just like mind blown. The lack of knowledge on education, IDEA. Oh boy, the bears. <laughs> Did all of you get your guns for your schools? Cause you know, the bears are coming. <laughs> And the thing that I, she couldn't answer any questions, uh, but she, she kind of answered them. <laughs> they were not answers. Um, and she was ignorant about everything related to um, education. And why do you think that is? Why do you think she was so ignorant about everything related to education? I think she, was she wasn't more. an educator. Mm -hmm. Wasn't an educator. Anybody else? He was worrying about the stakeholders more. Uh huh. Yeah. She didn't yeah. take the time to learn. <laughs> well, you know, part of that is because she had never stepped her butt into a public institution before getting the job. She came with a privatization agenda. She had not even been in these charter schools that she was pushing for and funding and sitting on boards of. She had not stepped foot in not one public institution. So consequently, when she tried to, the teachers weren't receptive to her. Um, it got to the point, I think after her third booing out of the school um, that she stopped making the tour. Um, but she still never really bothered to try to learn a job. She never really took it seriously because, you know, why? I 
go over here and do this with my money and whatever, whatever. And after Betsy arrived, it really was a new ball game. She pushed that privatization agenda that she came in with. Um, Ed rolled back various guidance on civil rights of students. Um, you know, Ed um, approved the state ESSA plans, even when they didn't meet the legal requirements of, of, the, um, of the law. Uh, she suspended or rewrote procedures on funding. She tried to delay the implementation of, of the disproportionality rule for students with disabilities. And so she was really, really, really on it to shift it to, um, I don't even know what to call that agenda. <laughs> she also wanted to shift money to private um, and charter schools. She's very big on that. Um, and she didn't think that, um, Students should have go to use bathrooms that matched their gender identity. So um, she really, really was looking to tear apart further public education. And once COVID hit, well, the gloves were off. DeVos told the states to spend the title funds intended for disadvantaged students however they saw fit. So it wasn't about need. It wasn't about resourcing children appropriately. It was about spend it however you want. Devil may care. Um, suspended lots of portions of the law, some of them of, of the procedures within the law, some of which did need to be suspended to account for COVID, um, but some of them didn't. Schools had to um, shift money that precious CARES Act money and give it over to the um, private schools, a section of private schools based upon their enrollment. Well, they're already cash strapped public institutions and now they had to share their money. She was sued, lost. Um, and so schools don't, districts don't have to turn that money over. However, some districts had already shifted it and you know the jury's out as to whether they'll get that back. So there was a lot of harm done with Betsy as well. Next, please. And that brings us to our current moment. So racial justice pushed to the forefront that Black Lives Matter um, and white folks ran out to support us. They were carrying signs, they were chanting, they were tearing up Portland. Um, <laughs> they were also being antagonistic on, on the other end. But the masses were in support of Black Lives Matter. They wanted to show us that, no, oh, we really are human and we're with you. And then, next slide. But the year before, the same liberals, were protesting letting more Black children into their schools. So Black Lives Matter, as long as you keep your Black A over there. Um, and they were very serious. This is a bastion of liberalism. This is Howard County, Maryland. And they did not want poor children into their schools. But look at the words on the signs. Kids before politics. You think they put kids before politics? I don't think they did. I don't think they did. They didn't put black children in before politics. They didn't put poor children before politics. And this is a school system that actually runs the black, li black student lives matter at school. <laughs> so watch the language, listen to what they say but look at what they do. Um, we heard some of the same double speak from can then candidate Biden when he felt comfortable enough to come out for our black card. He was joking, he said, but joking or not, that was never his place to do that joke. Um, and we were supposed to be okay with it. 
I think about um, William Clinton when he was stumping for his wife and he came on the Tom Joyner morning show and said Barack Obama needed to um, wait. It wasn't his turn and he needed to sit down and stand back. Now, again, more of that liberalism, but he, in other words, Barack needed to have, find his place. But we're seeing, if you could go back to the previous slide, previous slide, yeah, but this is what, this is who's supporting us. They're supporting us, but they're using, next slide, these words. And so we have to be really, really careful about that. Last week, President-elect Biden told the civil rights folks to pipe down on that defund the police stuff. You're getting us killed. Really? <laughs> We're dying in the streets, but a slogan is killing you. And then we had Barack Obama come behind him and back it up with the, you know, a catchy little slogan is fine, but what does it really get you when you're putting it out there and we're getting killed? We're dying. But these are the people who purportedly represent us. And so while as we're, um, looking forward and looking forward to this change in an administration, we're all relieved to see that we're back to the normal racism. It's comfortable. It feels like something we're used to, but understand these are the folks who are gonna be leading the new administration. Next. Um, and so we want to engage you all in what do you see with your glasses? What do you see in looking forward? What is this change in administration bringing for you? Who is that the secretary of education? Is, is that just going to be, is that going to be better or just different? And Tafari is going to um, give us instructions on the usage of how we're going to go along with this. We're going to build a word cloud and we want to collect your thoughts on what you see with your glasses. Yep, they all just will give me one moment. Thank you so much for that, Marlene. So I am about to drop a link into the Zoom chat, and it is going to uh, prompt you to go to a word cloud. And in that word cloud, all you're going to do is uh, drop in and respond to the uh, prompt that says, what do you see with your glasses? I'll give you about two minutes or so. Um, and um, we will um, see, you know, what you all say as this um, as this word cloud populates. So I'm going to share my screen again momentarily and let Marlene kind of uh, narrate the um, the proceedings as the word cloud gets populated. So. Um, Click on the link in the Zoom chat, fill it out, and then um, we will see what you say right here. So As what do you see with your glasses? If you could click on the chat, oh, I'll see the link in the chat. Did I accidentally send it to the, let me see. Um, I can pull it back out and put it back. Yeah, there's no oops. I actually, I didn't, I didn't click send. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> okay. So if you all would pull up your chat and click on the link, if you are low on bandwidth, we know what internet access has been like 
for these past 10 months. So you can also put your links um, in the in the chat. You can also put your words in the chat about what you see in your glasses, with your glasses. Um, and anything in the chat will pull out and add it to so that you won't have to have multiple things going. Continuous problems, institutional racism, opportunity, paternalism, What else do we say? Confusion. <laughs> That's for sure. We've, we've been living in confusion for a long time. And I, I, I think, um, I think people of color have just um, normalize things that should never ever be normalized. I'll give it about another 30 to 45 seconds. So think of your good words and toss them in. No respect for life. Wow. Um, is is um, someone from DSC pulling the things out of the chat, or do I should I be doing that? You can go ahead and highlight a couple of them, Marlon. No, no, I'm, I mean I'm doing that. I'm, I I just can't like put them. I can't submit into the word cloud more than once, so I have them though on my sheet. Oh, I got you. Thank you. So that's our marvelous um, Lakita, who is um, one of the great members, another great member of the DSC staff. Harms to children with disability. Con continued standardization of institutional racism. That fits very well. <laughs> we should make sentences out of this. <laughs> Minimal support for for black. I'm going to say probably people or students. Lack of funding. Somebody should blow that one up. <laughs> and white supremacy. Continuous problems for lack of support for black people because of white supremacy. We don't have the opportunity and they're continually standardizing institutional racism. Isn't that a great sentence? <laughs> yeah, I think so. And definitely folks can continue to add to this. This uh, live poll is going to stay live uh, throughout the duration of this conversation. So if you get inspired and haven't submitted anything yet, by all means, you can do so as the evening's proceedings continue. Uh, there'll actually be another word cloud that we'll do in a bit. Um, and I'm going to stop this part of the screen share for now. Um, but the link is still active. And gonna toss it back to Marlene, who um, I believe is gonna set us up for part two to take it over to our good folks, Guy and Hamida. Yeah, thank you, Tafari. Thank you everyone for participating in that, like collecting your feedback. It'll definitely inform um, how we move forward. And Guy Johnson and, and um, Hamida Labby are going to lead us through the next session section of an analysis of the things we're seeing with our glasses and the language we need to be looking for and listening for 
Do not let these people fool you. Thanks for that, Marlene. Hamida, I think I think you'll yes. you'll take it. Um, Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Good evening, everybody. Uh, me and my partner in crime guy are really excited to be with you tonight again. Um, before I get started, just a reminder, please continue to use the chat. We're here to get feedback, ideas, and suggestions from you. Um, also, so what we are about to do is to sort of walk through um, the history of the education secretaries, who they were, what their backgrounds were, and what they accomplished um, during their term. Uh, as a note, these are not, these are not endorsements. Um, from the Opportunity Institute, LDF, or DSC on, on what they did. This is just meant for us to have an understanding um, and some historical perspective of what the role of an education secretary uh, is and, and kind of walking through um, some of that history and how it can inform us for what we should be demanding and expecting today. So please continue to use the chat and, and engage in this discussion. Next slide. Okay, so as Marlene said at the top of the hour, uh, the education department was created in 1979. Not sure if, if all of us knew just how young uh, the department is, um, including the Office for Civil Rights that was created in 79, like she stated. So the first education secretary served under President Jimmy Carter, shameless plug from my home state of Georgia. Uh, <laughs> Um, that secretary's name was Shirley Huffstetler. Uh, she served from 79 to, to 1981. Prior to leading the first education department, she was a federal appellate judge. Um, her main role was, again, just the creation of the department and shifting education policy from what was then the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare into what we now know as the Department of Education. Um, and, and as we said, Congress established the Office for Civil Rights in the Education Department in 1979. So that was the first education secretary. It was more of establishing the department. The second education secretary served under Ronald Reagan from 1981 to 84. Um, initially, he was appointed to abolish the education department. Uh, they wanted to cut education spending and had the intention of pushing vouchers as well as tuition tax credit programs. They referred to this as strengthening the public education system, but with a strong private education component. This might sound familiar to many of us. Exactly, exactly, guys, sounds very familiar. Um, so in 1981, they passed the Education and Consolidation Improvement Act to reduce federal Title I regulations. Again, deregulation also sounds very familiar. Um, the implementation was not strong, although the intent was to focus money on uh, providing that to local and state uh, governments and agencies, again, uh, shrinking the role of the federal government and focusing on local control. He has been said to have been the least favorite member uh, of the cabinet. Um, he publicly supported the president's goals, but he penned a book describing his intention to influence movement conservatives. Uh, reading about this secretary was very interesting because he saw his job as publicly promoting what President Reagan wanted to do with decreasing the role of the education department, decreasing the role of the federal government in education, but privately, apparently, his goal was to try to influence them influenced the conservative movement to take more of an active role in public education. Uh, his major achievement was the publication of A Nation at Risk, a report that talks about bringing education issues to the forefront of the national agenda uh, and really highlighted that the public education system, system was failing to educate students. Uh, as we might be familiar in sometimes in politics, uh, he had one goal publicly and another goal privately and did not succeed in moving that administration in the way that he thought he could um, publicly on the issue of education. So soon after the publication of that report, 
uh, he resigned. I think this is definitely a really important point as we are all you know, interested in influencing and weighing in on who the next education secretary is and why it's important for there to be someone strong enough to take public positions and push the agenda for, for students, uh, public education students forward. Um, and sometimes what some of the challenges are for someone who isn't willing to, uh, or I, I guess I would say someone who thinks that they should be one way internally and another way externally. Some of the challenges of politics and how that plays a role when it comes to public education. The third education secretary is William J. Bennett. He also served under Ronald Reagan following the resignation of the previous secretary. He served from 85 to 1988. His priorities were higher academic standards, teacher evaluations. He was known to have battled teachers unions on the issue of merit pay. And they also pushed for increased school choice. So we see that the, the origins of school choice you know, was many decades ago. The, his last major report before leaving office that was published in 1988 was a kindergarten to eighth grade model curriculum published guidelines on what that elementary and middle school curriculum should be. Uh, and, and something to note, uh, again, that did, did not occur during his time as secretary, but is important as we consider the backgrounds and ideals of someone that serves in this position. In 2005, he resigned from the K-12 education company he founded in 1999 after a comment on a radio show where he said he does know that it's true that if you want to reduce crime, you could, if that were your sole purpose, you could abort every Black baby in this country and your crime rate would go down. He said that was impossible, ridiculous, and morally reprehensible thing to do, but your crime rate would go down. So again, as Marlene talked about the role of racism um, and how that is insidious, even in a part of our government agencies and people who have the power to make decisions over children of color and low-income children. But his career did not end there. In 2006, he launched and led Conservative Leaders for Education formed to advocate for accountability, high academic standards, local control and school choice under ESSA. So he continues to try to influence education today. The next education secretary is Lateral F. Cavazos. He also served under Reagan, but also served under President, the first Bush, George H.W. Bush. Uh, he served from 1988 to 1990. He was the first person of color to serve as education secretary. He was a former teacher and school administrator in Texas, I believe, um, called for an alliance between educators, policymakers, and the public to lower dropout rates and increase student achievement. Uh, one of the things that he did when he was in office was known to bring together over 100 education stakeholders to have a conversation about uh, education. He chaired the task force on Hispanic education, which led to Bush's executive order on excellence in education for Hispanic Americans. And this uh, again led to an executive order by that president. He called for a study, a national study of challenges faced by Native American students as well. He pushed back on proposed cuts in student aid, highlighting the particular harm on minority students. And with that point, I will say, Several of these folks that we'll talk about had higher education um, you know, goals and, and achievements in their administration. We don't note all of those here because our focus for today, of course, is on K-12 education. But we, of course, we will note that higher education is a part of the job of the education secretary. Um, so he pushed back on, on cuts to, to federal aid to, to uh, minority students. Um, and then he favored the grassroots approach and he had a pro-parental involvement approach as a tool to improve student achievement. One of the things that we'll say about Secretary Cavazos is, you know, obviously this is the first person of color um, in this role and obviously had more of a focus on people of color as a part of his time um, in the department. But, you know, he, he also sort of had this idea 
um, of, you know, that I kind of was sharing with Guy that I think is sort of that pull yourselves up by your bootstrap piece where he thought that some of the lack of achievement that he saw in, in people of color and particularly he, um, you know, particularly called out his own uh, community um, is that there's this lack of value placed on education. And only if this, if these communities could value education more then the people would succeed more. So while he did, you know, I think pointed the federal government in, in a direction that paid more attention to and took more action on serving students of color, it was still a little bit troubling because he thought that some of the lack of achievement was a fault of those communities of their own, and that only if they cared more to, to succeed that they would succeed. The next Secretary of Education was a name that we all might be more familiar with. Uh, Lamar Alexander served under George H.W. Bush, or as my mama calls him, Daddy Bush. <laughs> um, he served from 1991 to 1993. He was a former governor of Tennessee and former president of the University of Tennessee. Um, you know, majority of his legacy is related to higher education, so we don't have a ton here. Um, but he did help to lead a push for higher standards and a federal voucher program. As we know, he recently retired from the U.S. Senate, uh, where he chaired the Senate uh, Help Committee. And we are waiting to find out who will be his successor, which will inform a lot of the work that we all will be do go doing going forward. The next Secretary of Education is Richard Riley served under, here we are, yes, yeah, served under President Bill Clinton. Uh, he was an advocate for technology in the classroom and hosted the, sec the first Secretary's Conference on Education Technology. One of the things that we may be hearing a lot more about recently because of remote learning and the pandemic, um, he advocated for the creation of the Federal Communication Commission's E-Rate program which allows schools and libraries to receive discounted internet and telephone rates. So we're all a, a bit more familiar with the E-Rate program today. Another major accomplishment under his administration and under his term was ESCA reauthorization. And in 1994, they passed the Improving America Schools Act. This significantly revised the original elementary and secondary um, Education Act. Most of the funds focused on teacher improvement efforts based on professional development plans created and implemented by school districts and schools. For the first time, Title I will support partnerships between schools and parents for improved student achievement through school parent compacts. This bill, also, this reauthorization bill also added math and reading and language arts standards to be used to assess student groups and provide accountability. A student served by this new ESEA reauthorization program, including disadvantaged students under Title I, uh, migratory children, students that fall under the category of bilingual education, um, and the ed Indian education program will all be expected to achieve the same standards of other students. This reauthorization also reduced the threshold for schools to implement school-wide programs. They moved that from 75% poverty down to 50% and gave schools a longer reign to use federal funding from multiple programs to disperse funds at a school-wide level. And finally, this reauthorization bill also gave more local control overall so that federal officials and states had the authority to waive federal requirements that interfered with school improvements. The next education secretary was Rod Page. He served under George W. Bush from 2001 to 2005. He was the son of public education, excuse me, public school educators uh, from Mississippi. He was an HBCU graduate, graduated from Jackson State University. He helped to create the No Child Left Behind Act. We already sort of covered what some of your memories were of that bill earlier. We were all sort of around for that. 
Um, this was based on partly on his work as superintendent of Houston Independent School District. After the measure was signed into law in January 2002, he oversaw the law's implementation. And I think it's clear from what I said already, but he was the first black education secretary and the first person to serve in that role who had been a superintendent. Uh, again, back to No Child Left Behind, this also required teachers to be considered highly qualified and it monitored schools, what was called adequate yearly progress. And this meant if a school misses their annual achievement targets for two years or more, or either for all of the students or for a particular subgroup, it would be identified as not making AYP adequate yearly progress and could be subject to sanction. The next ed education secretary was Margaret Spellings, also served under George W. Bush from 2005 to 2009. She oversaw more implementation of No Child Left Behind. Um, she put in place financial incentives for educators based on student achievement gains. Again, that kind of takes us back to some of the ideas around merit pay. She advocated for expanded school choice issued rules on academic standards for students with disabilities and English language learners. Notably, she led Bush's American Competitive Initiative, which focused on math and science instruction and pushed high schools to use more advanced coursework. And she also was known for putting in place national SMART grants, which provided millions of dollars to low-income students to major in math, science, or foreign languages. So this might have been the STEM push that we all remember. All right, and now to a bit more recent history. Uh, Arnie Duncan served under President Obama from 2009 to 2016. He oversaw massive education spending under the American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act, including Race to the Top. This was one of their signature programs, which was a 4.33 $35 billion competitive grant program that funded education redesign initiatives by the states. The education department under his leadership offered conditional waivers from the requirements of No Child Left Behind if states agree to initiatives such as common standards, common core, uh, and teacher evaluations based on student test scores. They invested more than $7 billion into school improvement grant programs which were aimed at fixing the nation's lowest performing schools. One of the most important things from this uh, administration in this time period was the executive order that in 2012, that created the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African-Americans. And, you know, we could conclude, of course, that there were some issues um, and maybe some demands, as Marlene said, there were some things that people wanted that maybe perhaps we didn't give, but there are some things to take note of um, following the creation of this initiative and other focuses of this administration. And that led to a high school graduate for African-American students that were at their at its high, highest point in history. And in 2013 to 2014, in that academic year, 72.5% of black public high school students graduated within four years. And since the president took office, over 1 million more Black and Hispanic students enrolled in college. Some other things under Arnie, Duncan, Arnie Duncan's term, well, or his reign, or shall we call it his term, he's not president, but uh, under Arnie Duncan's time as education secretary, we should say, um, he opposed zero tolerance policies, arguing that it disproportionately targeted Black and Latinx students for minor infractions. And this led to the issuance of school discipline guidance in 2014, which in addressed both intentional discrimination and disparate impact. And I have to do a special shout out to our next presenter, Guy Johnson on this, because he served um, in the administration during this time where there was this increased focus on looking at racial discrimination, um, both intentional, like we said, and, and disparate impact. So he was working with the Office for Civil Rights. Um, and in 2016, the education department released school climate surveys in an effort to create safe, nurturing learning environments. So we see under the Obama administration, there was a greater focus on school discipline 
um, school climate and the graduation rate of students of color and particularly Black and Latinx students. Next is John B. King Jr., the 10th Education Secretary. He served under Obama for a short time at the end of the administration from 2016 to 17. Um, he was a former educator from New York. He advocated for a national policy on internet access. He issued a late, which we know now how important that is. Again, now in remote learning, it's very interesting to look at some of the things that prior secretaries were pushing for, that if those things were sort of taken seriously and acted upon during that time, you have to wonder um, how differently, you know, would things be today uh, with the broadband gap and all of the challenges that students and families are facing today to have access to education during the pandemic. So again, you know, he, he pushed for this national policy on internet access and we sure uh, see the importance of that today. He also issued a letter to state leaders calling for an end to the use of corporal punishment in schools. We know that that is certainly a very important issue for many of the members on this call today who are doing work at the state level to end corporal punishment across the South and in other states in the country. In September 2016, the Education Department under his leadership released tools to assist states, districts, and schools in implementing best practices for the appropriate use of school resource officers. This was intended to be guidance on how to safeguard students while protecting civil rights. Of course, again, this is sort of a snapshot in history. This is four years ago, and obviously the conversation today on school resource officers is quite different. It's far more rooted in abolition. Um, I'm sure many of the advocates and people on this call right now have been pushing for abolition long before this time, and we're likely we're pushing for it during that time. Um, but again, it's just interesting to take note of, you know, what position the administration took, what they were what they were advocating for, and kind of looking at where we are today, what the demands are, um, and thinking about what that means going forward and, and where they should move what that next education secretary should be demanding. He now leads the education trust. Um, the secretary after that is Betsy DeVos. And I'm not sure if I need to give a summary on her because I think we've, we've talked quite a bit about Ms. DeVos today uh, already. Marlene gave a great uh, overview and many of you chimed in in the chat and, and what we know about the last four years under that secretary of education. Um, so that is our history of education secretaries and I hope that some of that is helpful for us to take note of both what are some of the politics and how that plays a role for the secretary, how sometimes identity and previous, um, previous roles and previous careers and what role that plays, how that influences their priorities as education secretary, and also where we are as a country and what difference that makes and how, how that should shift um, their priorities or make their demands more bold. Um, as the next person, you know, comes into office. I will pass this over to my colleague, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Hamida, as always. Um, uh, we, and thanks for that uh, comprehensive kind of oversight um, or review. I will, I will be pretty quick um, and, and just offer a couple of things. Um, so first there's, I think there's two or three big themes to say, um, one, um, you know, we, we joked about um, Betsy DeVos and uh, the guns for students to protect themselves from grizzly bears. It's, it's amazing that that actually happened at a congressional hearing. If you, if you ever want to watch, um, if you ever want to watch uh, something stomach curdling, you can watch then Senator Al Frank and ask her questions and, you know, just clueless. So the new administration represents a return to basic competency, right, which is good, um, but also probably insufficient. Um, and I also think there's a danger that to look too far ahead to, uh, to January because there's, there's a, enough time between now uh, and the inauguration for some chicanery to happen. So a couple things to keep an eye out for. There's, it, and this isn't only with regard to the education sphere. Um, there is the thought um, that the Trump administration across the board wants to tie the hands of the incoming Biden administration by passing policies, making decisions, and trying to get things started that will be hard to unwind for the new president. So there's a so just for example, um, 
today's Tuesday. So yesterday, uh, under the cover of all the haze and all the news, uh, U.S., uh, I should say, uh, President Trump announced a new federal rule that would broaden eligibility for religious schools to get federal, uh, sorry, for religious groups to get federal grants. Uh, on its face, that's what it is. But when you look at how it applies to USA, it means that faith-based charter schools in particular will be able to get money so long as the money is not used for quote unquote explicitly religious purposes, which is a pretty broad, I mean, in my understanding, and if others on the call know better, um, please uh, please in, uh, uh, help us out in the chat. But that seems like a pretty massive loophole, right? Um, the other, so there's more, so there's a rule that rules aren't necessarily forever. That can be that can be unwound by the Biden administration, but it has to be unwound. There's a public notice comment, a public notice and comment period. It's a process. So that federal rule is in effect, making more federal money available to private schools. Um, there was also, I won't get into these details earlier, but there was, uh, I think Marlin mentioned, Trump administration effort to put CARES Act money and make it more available to private schools. Um, that's true. And they lost at least two, well, one lawsuit on that, another on a, on a related issue. But they're not necessarily done yet. Just because they lost those lawsuits uh, doesn't mean that that fight is particularly over. So there's been reporting in Politico and the Washington Post that the Trump administration is... Um, is considering a proposal allowing unspent COVID-19 relief money um, to be used for school vouchers when uh, for parents in school districts that have closed some of the schools for in-person instruction. So if you're in a place where you're, uh, all the schools are not giving full instruction in person to all the students, the Trump administration is considering opening up unspent COVID-19 uh, funds for vouchers for schools. Um, and you'll notice there is a third bullet um, on that uh, slide, which is unfilled because there is more that's coming, right? Um, so it, again, there's enough time for guidances, um, you know, uh, and et cetera to come forward. Let's go to the next slide. The other, the other piece here um, is the secretary is kind of the tip of the iceberg, right? So um, for all of uh, the talk, as you referenced, Camita, that we've done about um, Betsy DeVos, I want to, I want to um, raise, uh, put your attention, remind you uh, on, um, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Jackson, who, um, but Candace Jackson, who was, I think, the first acting assistant secretary for the Office of Civil Rights at U.S. said, if you ever have spare moment, I don't necessarily suggest you do this, but if, you know, um, you want your stomach to turn a little bit, you can just look at her Wikipedia page. Um, her claim to fame in terms of the federal enforcement of civil rights is she wrote a, two, a book in 2005 called Their Lives, the Women Targeted by the Clinton Machine. And then she was hired by Roger Stone to produce a video profiling uh, somebody who Hillary Clinton had defended in court. That those were her civil rights credentials, right? Okay, every red box on here, like the Secretary for Education, um, Candace Jackson was only acting, so she didn't have to go, she didn't have to be Senate confirmed. All of the people in these red boxes are political appointees. I don't know if they're all subject to Senate confirmation, um, but but the office of the, the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights certainly is. Uh, that may be one of the reasons why uh, Candace Jackson didn't go forward as um, official um, Assistant Secretary. But it's to say, the you know the Secretary uh, and U.S. said is sprawling. It is there are other agencies like Labor, USDA, which is worth your attention um, if 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 you're into this kind of thing with Tom Vilsack and his history. I won't get into it. Um, they're here, but it's worth a little digging. Um, all of those have the Secretary at the tip of the iceberg, and then these political appointees, numerous political appointees above them. These political appointees, by and large, are the ones that uh, shape the uh, direction and the vision of the offices they run. So the, the priorities of the Office for Civil Rights are presumably established by the President at some broad strokes, but is Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights that manages that on a daily basis. That, determines the procedures for when a complaint can go forward, how many days you have to respond, et cetera. Some of the details are set by statute, not all the details. So all of these red boxes have the power to set vision 
for the little fiefdoms they run within US Ed. And it's like that within the other organizations as well. So uh, the secretary gets a lot of the attention, but, but there, is, there is a lot uh, going on within this agency. So next slide, please. Um, so as, as Biden takes office, um, those of you uh, um, who know me know that I work in mnemonics a lot. That's the way I keep my, my brain straight. Um, and so what I would suggest is dollar bill time um, when the inauguration comes. And I'll go through what I mean by dollar bill time. So dollar, um, you're gonna have a federal budget um, that, and you're gonna have, uh, Biden is gonna start talking about what he wants to do with the federal budget. One of the things you may know that he wants to do is triple the amount of Title I funding. Um, uh, the, the popular saying is that budgets are moral documents. And so tripling Title I funding is certainly a good sign. Whether or not that actually has a chance going forward kind of depends on what happens in the Georgia Senate races next month. But even if um, he doesn't, even if Biden's uh, uh, a goal of tripling Title I funding doesn't happen, Right. Even if it's flat funded, um, look at where the money goes. Right. So is the money going to go into civil rights enforcement? Is it going to go into uh, the offices that work with English language learners, English language acquisition students with disabilities? And in particular, are they hiring up career staff? You had a lot, a big exodus of career staff from U.S. Ed during the Trump administration. Um, pause, um, there are spaces to be filled, especially if there is work to be done. I think there's work to be done. So, um, so the headline will be uh, Biden does or doesn't get a triple amount of Title I funding in the budget. The thing to look under the headline is how much is OCR getting? How much are English learners getting? Are they hiring career staff who presumably will be there, unlike the political appointees, for years? Um, okay. That's part one. So dollar, budget, bill. Um, believe it or not, ESSA, the latest reauthorization of ESCA, as Marlin put it, the latest branding, it's already up for reauthorization. So it's already time to write a new bill. Um, that sounds a little crazy and it doesn't mean it has to happen. Um, no Child Left Behind uh, was up for reauthorization, I think for a decade before they finally got around to reauthorizing it. But, um, with what we're seeing with COVID and the shift in learning it, and with the new administration uh, that, that is gonna have more attention to these things, I think it's safe to say we could see uh, a new reauthorization of the law. Probably not first 30, 60, 90, 100, 200 days, but I think you could start seeing it, especially as kids, as students get back to school in September. So what's going to happen, for example, um, the headlines you'll see over the next couple of weeks next couple months, really early 2021, are gonna be, do states get waivers from testing requirements, right? And that's a big concern. I don't know how the administration is gonna go on that. The question after that is what role does do federal testing standards and state testing standards play in the next reauthorization of ESSA? Again, it won't be 100 days, it'll be in the fall next year when they start batting it around, I think, or maybe even early 2022. But that stage is being set already. Okay, so dollar budget bill uh, ESSA as a law and the new, the new reauthorization and then time. The, the big thing, um, one of the big issues that states and districts are going to be facing is this, what do you do for, um, some people call it learning loss. Um, some of the advocates I work with don't, don't like that term uh, because they say learning happens everywhere, okay? Um, they prefer instructional time or uh, yeah, we'll say instructional loss or instructional time. So what happens um, when schools start opening up the way they looked last year? Um, it probably won't look exactly like it did last year or the year before, but the big question here is remediation versus acceleration. So do you try and hold students back for a year or for six months and make up for the time lost or and we get the opportunity to think, institute think this is the better way to go. Do you try to um, uh, accelerate? So bring students up to grade level while providing them with the instructional support and what they need to progress, right? As opposed to losing time remediating. 
that, that's a longer conversation than we have time for here. But there doesn't appear to be, even within states, a lot of unanimity on remediation versus acceleration. And let's say you do go for acceleration, what that looks like um, and how it's going to be supported in terms of money and staffing. So dollar bill time are things to look for in the new administration in early 2021. Uh, budget, ESSA reauthorization, and this remediation versus acceleration um, debate. Okay, um, and, I, and let's go to the next slide. And so with this, and as we, as we talk about priorities, and oh, I'm sorry, I mean, back to you, I apologize. You can finish what you were going to say. No, I, so I think when we, when we think that the, the next step here is going to be, right, the, as always, the local debates and the federal national debates are going to be closely connected. So we know what the needs are and the needs have been on a local level and what kind of federal, uh, what kind of federal levers do we have available to move that forward on a national basis? And I think there's, there's two things, and then Hamid, I will pass it over to you. It's like, one, on a basic competency level, what's the minimum that needs to be done? And okay, once we've done what competent people do, what can we do to actually meet the needs of the moment? Hamid, thank you. Absolutely, thank you, Guy. Um, and I'm actually going to try to move very quickly because we are at the point where we wanted to begin hearing from you all. So I'm gonna move quickly. So what should the next education secretary prioritize? And this is, you know, we're, we're gonna give some ideas here, but this is meant just to get some of the juices flowing, get some of your ideas flowing um, so that as we move into the brainstorming part of the agenda, um, this hopefully will give you all some ideas. So some of the demands are first to restore guidance on racial integration and diversity in our country's K-12 public education schools and institutions of higher learning. Uh, the Department of Justice should, you know, who does have um, influence here when it comes to education to withdraw statements of interest opposing racial integration and diversity in pending cases. Um, they should also restore the 2014 school discipline joint guidance from the Department of Education and Department of Justice focused on identifying, avoiding, and remedying, remedying discriminatory discipline practices in schools and providing equal educational opportunities for all students. Um, this includes emphasizing the significance of Title IV and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits schools from intentionally disciplining disciplining students differently based on race. Uh, it also includes provisions related to disparate impact, uh, which says schools may violate federal law with a, it's a bit of a wonky term, the, the facially neutral. So policies that don't, uh, you know, very obviously um, seem discriminatory, but have discriminatory effects. Um, and what should they rescind? They should rescind the order from President Trump uh, and under Betsy DeVos's time, um, the president's advisory on the 1776 commission. This was, you know, their work on quote unquote, uh, patriotic education. This was the Trump administration's effort to shift the discussion on race and racism. This happened very recently. It was, it was November 2nd, right before election day. Um, this was similar to the administration's attack on the 1619 project, if folks were paying attention to that. Um, it's meant to discourage and penalize education on civil rights and the nation's history, um, if any sort of education on the nation's history when it comes to racial inequity and directing agencies to withhold federal funding from education institutions that don't comply with their orders. Um, and they kind of took this past just education and talked about how this, you know, relates to America's um, things like national parks, battlefields, monuments, which you know we know is a big fight in the has been a big fight in the country for quite a while. Looking at the monuments and how that you know has a role in the fight for racial justice today, um, museums and other landmarks. Um, next slide. Uh, the education secretary should also prioritize expanding the civil rights data collection. This is including. Um, this includes making it an annual collection as opposed to biennial, biennial um, and reporting, 
reasons for school discipline practices in the data collection disaggregated by race, eliminate funding for school police, reallocate those resources to support counselors and other student supports that are proven to improve school climate and decrease the use of exclusionary school discipline practices. Again, work that you all are doing on the ground. Um, this secretary should demonstrate a commitment to enforcing civil rights laws, such as Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and its implementing regulations. Um, not just release, I mean, excuse me, not just to reissue the 2014 guidance, as we mentioned, but also to expand upon it. Um, you know, we'll be talking a bit more about that, I'm sure, in the in the discussion with everyone. Issue guidance on how the Education Department's Office for Civil Rights should use disparate impact to e evaluate civil rights complaints. That was something that the Trump administration has definitely backpedaled on and should be a major priority for the next administration. Um, issue guidance on how ESSA's requirements for annual assessments and accountability systems will be implemented Adjusting for the limitations presented by remote learning and the broadband gap, this is certainly a conversation within the civil rights and the educational equity community right now. Um, how do we use assessments? You know, how, how, do we, how do we give assessments when some students don't have any access to instruction, to technology right now? And for those um, that do, how do we use the results of those assessments equitably to make sure that students and teachers are not punished um, because of the uh, challenges that are posed by remote learning that's happening you know, right now. Um, and finally, initiate a study on the disaggregated impacts of, on student learning and well-being of, uh, of all students due to the pandemic. Um, so of course, one of the things that we're seeing come up repeatedly is not just undoing the damage of the prior administration, but how do we expand upon the goals um, that this community would like to see in public education, and also how do we specifically address some of the challenges that have come up um, directly related to the pandemic-induced remote learning um, and other challenges that students and teachers and parents are dealing with right now. And with that, we are going to move to the next section. I'm going to pass it to Marlene, and we are really excited to hear from you all and what you want to see from the next administration and the next secretary. Secretary for me. Cool. So I am Daquan Harrison. Um, <laughs> so unfortunately, Daquan can't be with us. So I'm going to um, attempt to walk in his greatness. <laughs> we'll see how I do, right? So I want to hold a discussion with you all um, around what you've heard, what you think, um, and let's start with what stood out for you based on what you've heard so far. Please share in the chat. Or if you wanna unmute yourself and tell us. Thank God, because I did not want to type that out. Hi, everybody. How's it been doing? My name's uh, Ayo. I'm with the Boston Student Advisory Council slash Youth on Board. And one thing that really jumped out to me, especially after it's just the various different versions of, you know, educational policy and reform, quote unquote, I noticed that they, they love to just give every student the same size hat. And one thing about me is I don't like one size hat fits all. I want one that's adjustable, that's made just for me. So I think one thing um, that stood out to me was that they, they, they generalize education for a lot of students. But I, I'm sure that we've all known throughout our walks of life each student learns differently, they comprehend differently, their different styles of learning. Obviously, you know, we've come a long way from when we used to, you know, stuff kids 12 by 12, I mean, 6 by 6 in classrooms and whatnot. But, um, Still, education has such a far way to go in order to accommodate students and make the best environment for them to reach towards the future that they want for themselves. Thank you for that. So on point. Um, and I, I like that you don't, you don't have the same size hat, like adjustable. And some people don't want a hat. 
<laughs> Say what about them? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> right, right, right. So does anyone else want to share? Can either unmute and then remute yourself. Um, <laughs> but does anyone else want to share or in the chat if you want to share what stood out for you based on what you've heard? Hi, Marlin. Hi. Um, this is Kim in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, the, the, this conversation just really made me think about why do we need the Department of Education from listening to the history and the creation and the, all, all of what we've endured since you know I was in high school. Um, why do we need, what is the purpose really of the Department of Education, especially, especially now, right? Given the data, given the failed attempts at reform and all of these things, is this an opportunity for us to kind of like even reorganize the purpose of the Department of Education and what we need a Department of Education to be to us, right? Like, as opposed to continually taking what they think they should be <laughs> to us that's failing and trying to revamp it, re this, re that it, you know? Um, it just makes me think about that because I could see that department becoming a more regional department. Maybe you don't, you need more than one secretary of education where, where it's like broken up into regions so that there could be more contact if they're going to be effective, like on the ground, right? More engagement on the ground, if that's, you know, what we need it to be. But this conversation just makes me think of also, how do we eliminate the need for a civil rights, you know, a constant uh, challenge to civil rights um, and in exchange really for human rights, you know, in regard to education. So that's kind of like where this conversation has taken me. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm gonna assume that you meant, um, how do we eliminate it peacefully? <laughs> Excuse me? I'm going to assume you meant how do we eliminate it peacefully. My mind went somewhere else. So that's probably a me. Right. Um, I'm just going to share a couple in the um, chat. Um, education has not gotten better. It's gotten different. It, it has been different and worse since 1609. Um, how do we demand something different? What does that look like? We make our, our own schools again, educate our own again. Um, and so that's some of the things that have come up on the chat. I wanna share some of the things that um, DSC and looking at the time. So I wanna be mindful of that. Looking at some of the things that um, DSC uh, members have lifted. Um, we issued a survey, I believe a couple of weeks ago and um, we wanted to know what our members thought about this, this change in administration, what are the opportunities, da, 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 da. And so some of the priority notes that um, from the member survey are, um, the Secretary of Ed should use their administrative authority to defund federal funding for police and schools. They should create rules and guidance to implement everything in the DSC model code that they possibly can. They should prioritize um, ensuring every student has access to remote learning tools, including laptops and broadband, and that they provide accessibility so all students can use it. Um, and especially students with disabilities and English language learners. Better protections for students, uh, more protect, build better protections than FERPA. Um, and when we asked um, our members, if you could design a secretary of education, what characteristics, what characteristics would they have? What skills would they possess? What about the content of their background? And I would love as I'm reading some of these, if you could share your thoughts on those too in the chat. So um, some of the responses, cultural sensitivity, understand children of trauma, 
special education background, understanding educating um, English language learners, understand the need for vocational education um, to be available to all learners. Wow, that one is deep. Um, a former educator and administrator, curriculum and instruction experience, possess a racial equity lens, um, a team leader, someone that's collaborative, and um, a background that understands the role of community schools. And what experiences, real quickly, would you prefer an incoming secretary to have had prior to being appointed? Um, and please share your questions, your answers to these questions too in the chat. Commitment to public schools, teaching and supervision experience in schools, at minimum, at least 15 years in public education as an educator, teacher with experience in more than one state showing success with black children. And so those are some of the things that have, um, and I won't share any more because we still have to close out, <laughs> but those are some of the things that our members came up with in this survey. And I would love for you all to, um, Think through those questions as we're doing closing. I will try to post some of them in the chat. I'm kind of challenged doing quickly doing any of this stuff when I'm on, uh, on Zoom meetings, but I'm going to turn it over to Tafari to, to close us out. All right, good folks. So no, thank you so much for that, Marlene. I will uh, take you off spotlight, which is uh, which is always the hardest part of the job, right? Taking Marlene off spotlight. Um, I took me off. Don't worry about uh, it. <laughs> No, so uh, just very briefly, you all, again, I want to um, say, you know, definitely see this um, as an informational building kind of part one, um, because what we when we conceptualize this event, we were talking about, you know, regardless of who the Biden administration picks, uh, what about the institutional infrastructure and what arrangement does that have vis-a-vis -vis everyday people, parents, students, teachers that are trying to do right by our young people, what is the uh, institutional arrangement such that um, it prevents those things from materially happening while articulating a vision uh, that sounds like something we want to hear, which is the height of like neo neoliberal ethos. Um, so kind of like absorb, um, distill, um, <laughs> diffuse, um, and then work to get reelected and um, privatize. And so I wanted to end this conversation with uh, two really, really short pieces um, that put us in a historical lens, but then also get us out of here. Because I think that, um, you know, borrowing from a very like uh, West African tradition of Sankofa, looking back and going back and fetching things in order to use them in the present day, I think it's, uh, it's a useful paradigm for this. So I'm going to share very quickly uh, from the work of uh, the late scholar activist Jack O'Dell, um, who was among other things an advisor to Martin Luther King, uh, part of the team that was advising Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Push Coalition, um, and a few other things. But really quickly, I'm going to say he wrote an essay um, in 1978 called Transition from Civil Rights to Civil Equality that I would highly recommend checking out. And this is by no means a full portrait of what I think is the brilliance of his writing. But um, this is, uh, I think, a poignant piece that he's writing in the 70s about public education. And so Odell says that um, in an attack upon the hypocrisy of the separate but equal doctrine, which had become the legal basis for institutionalizing segregation in the Southern states, the Supreme Court in 1954 correctly decided that the separate public school facilities Black Americans were required to use under segregation were inherently unequal. Armed with this legal victory, which we had sought in the courts, a mass movement was launched to desegregate all of the public accommodations. The process of this movement's development from Montgomery and Little Rock to Memphis has been amply recorded. The press and media reported upon these widespread activities and labeled them in quote unquote integration movement. That was a minor distortion, which in itself was not too serious, but it laid the basis for the more recent distortion called racial balance in the public schools. Our movement has historically fought for quality education. It has never been an article of faith of this movement that the racial balance in public schools had any inherent value. 
it might be a desirable byproduct of having reorganized the educational system to provide quality education for all the children, but as a goal in itself, racial balance is something the courts have made a goal in pursuit of integration. All the while, the quality of education continues to deteriorate. Racial balance without quality education is a distortion of the intent and purpose of our movement, North and South, to desegregate public schools. It is an interesting distortion because it feeds the racist conception that the obvious decline in the quality of education in the public schools is due to the fact that they are being desegregated. The educational authorities allegedly had to, quote unquote, lower the standards in order to integrate the Blacks. So the public impression that is created is that the Black community has as its goal lowering the educational standards in public schools in order to be, quote unquote, integrated, when in fact the very opposite is true. Black Americans have always sought quality education. This twist in turn is designed to alienate white parents who might very well be in favor of abolishing segregated public schools, but are certainly not in favor of reducing educational standards for their children, which is the implied result of schools being integrated for quote unquote racial balance. In this process, the democratic goal of desegregated quality education in public schools for all children is distorted and put to the service of reinforcing racist attitudes and stereotypes. Almost done. In form, the goal of a desegregated public school system was conceded, while in substance, the, available, the availability of quality education was denied. This distinction between form and substance and their interaction is a critical philosophical and practical problem that every movement for social change is challenged to understand. In all fields, it is often the difference between making real progress and merely appearing to make progress. I think that's really important um, to think about in this moment. And again, it goes on, but it's already three minutes after our time. Again, I highly recommend um, finding Jack O'Dell any way you can and reading his work. But um, I want to say thank you um, to Guy, Hamida, Daquan, who was not able to join us, uh, to all of our federal liaisons, to Marlene Tillman, uh, to you know the team that makes this, this work possible. And as I share my screen one more time as we get ready to go, I want to remind folks, as I said previously, that this is uh, part one of a three-part series looking at the institutions of education, of public education in the United States, less the, the people, the characters uh, that populate the seats that make these uh, places happen. Both are certainly important, so it's it's not it's a it's a question of emphasis, not of importance. Um, and so um, the next event that we have is uh, our first the scheduled publicly facing event in 2021, uh, January 27th, uh, called The State in Education, Unpacking the State Level Institutions that Shape Our Schools. And that's a piece that we're developing now as part two of this federal, state, and local uh, kind of conversation about, as I said, the institutions that drive this thing we call public education. And so if there's something that you learned that you love, please share it. Um, if there's something that you liked, uh, don't keep it a secret to yourself. Uh, because again, the goal that we're moving towards is is uh, not just a legislative victory, but a culture of victory um, and a culture that where our students in the everyday environments feel the effects of the work that uh, all of us are doing. So again, I want to say thank you to Marlene, Guy, Hamida, those of you that are in the chat. Um, please, again, this is available on Facebook. Um, so once it finishes, you can share it out. And um, as Fred Hampton would say to you, I say to you, peace if you're willing to fight for it. Uh, take care, y'all. Peace.